Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Gabriele Magni, and I'm the director of the Global Policy Institute. And today we are very excited to be here to celebrate the 2021 Global Policy Institute Book Award winner. Uh, before we start, I just want to say that today our thoughts go to the people of Ukraine who are facing military invasion and were seeing their lives disrupted by war. And I think it is hard in a day like today to, to concentrate to do work. But today we're going to listen to and learn uh, about empire and self-determination. And so I think it's a very timely topic considering how the desire really for imperialism is still alive and well today, including in Europe. Um, the Global Policy Institute Book Award started a few years ago, thank you to the leadership of Michael Genovese. And Professor Genovese is here with us today. He's the president of the Global Policy Institute. And the award celebrates the most important book that was published in the field of international relation and global policy in the previous calendar year. Previous winners include Pete Panori, Steve Levitsky, Anne-Marie Slaughter, and Joseph Nye. This year, we are very excited to honor the winner of the 2021 award, Dr. Adam, Adam Getachew. Dr. Getachew is the Neubauer Family Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago, and she's the author of World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination. World Making After Empire offers an account of self-determination, offering the political thought of Black Atlantic anti-colonial nationalists during the height of the colonization in the 20th century. The book has already received numerous recognition, including several awards from various sections of the American Political Science Association, the Caribbean Political Asso Philosophical Association, the African Studies Association, the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, the ISA, and it was one of the foreign affairs best books. And so it is an honor today to add the GPI Book Award to the growing list of recognition and to host Dr. Getachew today. And the event will be moderated by Annie Kalai, who is a GPI fellow, and she's an LMU student. And so I'll let Annika explain how the event today will unfold. Thank you, Professor Magni, and welcome to LMU, um, Dr. Gedichu. Uh, so for today's event, um, Dr. Gedichu will begin with a presentation on her novel. Uh, we will then get the opportunity to ask some questions and fear, hear from her. I'll start with a couple of book-related questions before opening up the floor to questions from the audience. Um, and with that being said, the Global Policy Institute at Loyola Marymount University is very pleased to welcome Dr. Adam Gedichu at the 2021 Global Policy Book Award. Um, please take it away whenever you're ready. Great. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm deeply honored uh, to receive this award. Um, I want to thank Professor Magni for organizing um, and for we've been in conversation about this event for quite a while. So I'm glad that it's finally come to fruition. And it's lovely to see friends and uh, new colleagues and comrades on screen. Um, I also want to start uh, with Ukraine, um, and um, I'm like everyone, you know, watching the news uh, very closely, and, you know, uh, it's a major crisis and transformation, and I want to share something for you all to see afterwards, um, which is a video of uh, the Kenyan representative to the UN speaking about, about Ukraine, and I think one of the things the uh, representative says is, um, you know, as African, as African, as a representative of an African state who had, who, uh, where borders were violently drawn, the moment of decolonization, you know, raised this question about borders and how to think about borders, to understand that borders were artificially constructed, but that the attempt to revise and reconstitute borders to meet ethnic, national, and linguistic lines would always be a violent project and process. And so in the moment of decolonization, African states agreed largely to leave the borders as they were, not because they thought they were natural or sacrosanct, uh, but because they thought this was at least a position from which to start and to build a future from this place, even as they understood the kind of colonial construction of, of the state form. Um, so I raise that because I think that it speaks to what is at the core of my book, an argument that 
um, black thinkers, uh, black state makers in the 20th century have much to teach us about international politics and about the world order. And that thinking about the world from Africa, from the global south, uh, opens up new opportunities um, uh, for us to think about what it means to create a global order, uh, what international justice might mean. Um, so I, I want to start with that, and I hope we can come, come back to that, the, our contemporary moment. In many ways, this is a book that is a product of the contemporary crisis of our international order. Um, I began this project uh, as a dissertation um, at Yale University, where I was a student both in African American studies and political science. And really, uh, you know, I wrote a proposal for a dissertation in the moment of uh, the Libya intervention in 2011, where the responsibility to pr protect a national international humanitarian norm was mobilized um, in service of what ended up being, you know, um, uh, a new state building project. In some ways, I think we um, live, you know, that moment of 2011, of course, arrived after a decade of, of uh, the US war on te terror and an attempt to really rewrite the rules of international, international law and international institutions. Um, uh, you know, so this was a period of waning sovereign, in sovereign equality, the norms of sovereign equality and non-intervention, which, which had been so important in the post-war period was, were disregarded. Um, the efforts to contain and constrain um, you, use of force uh, were entirely abrogated by the United States in various illegal wars, starting in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And I think it's 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 worth thinking about what's happening in Ukraine as an extension of U.S. empire and U.S. war making, rather than its opposite, which is the narrative we will be hearing today and every day, um, you know, from the U.S. government. So, you know, so that's the kind of historical context and background against which I wrote this book. I was also particularly interested in a set of debates in political theory in which this same period in which there was a resurgent American imperialism became a moment to celebrate the end of the state structure, the birth of a new cosmopolitan order or a West, uh, post Westphalian world order, as, as a variety of theorists would call it. Um, and I, in large part, um, you know, you know, one kind of question I was interested in is what what makes it possible for these two things to happen simultaneously, right? How is it that a, the a set of theorists, um, egalitarians, liberals, anti-imperialists, could celebrate the end of of, of sovereign equality, right? Of, of the, the, the birth of a post Westphalian order at the same time when the practical realities of that new world order was not a cosmopolitan one, but an imperial one, largely a re resurgence of empire. So in my view, that project of cosmopolitan political theory was one deeply tied uh, to the European experience of the post-war period. It was one that saw cosmopolitanism and internationalism as primarily responses to the Holocaust and to the problem of interstate war represented by World War II um, most immediately, but of course also earlier moments. So from this kind of perspective of, of kind of cosmopolitan political theory, the problem of the 20th century, we might say, was an excessive and unconstrained state. And this, the question then for cosmopolitan theory was how to create legal and political restraints on the sovereign state. What my book tries to do is to point to a different set of dilemmas about international politics that emerge when we take empire um, and the struggle against it as the problem of the 20th century. After all, most of the world in 1945 could not be said could not be said to enjoy sovereignty and therefore didn't have excessive sovereignty to worry about. Moreover, as a, as, as a variety of anti-imperial critics would point out about, about World War II and about forms of interstate violence in Europe, 
they were deeply tied to a hierarchical world order. That is, as Du Bois would say in the African Roots of War, war writing about uh, World War I, um, the real struggle and competition in, among European states was about the control of Africa and the control of labor, of markets and resources uh, across the peripheral world. So for them, it was really the problem of empire, which was at the center of, of, uh, of, of the kind of the problem of the 20th century. Um, and it would be by thinking about a set of responses to this, this part predicament, this dilemma that uh, could generate a kind of vision of an egalitarian and therefore a post-imperial world order. So then my book starts with a central question. Um, uh, you know, the central question of the book then is what vision of the world emerges when we take empire to be uh, the central preoccupation, the central predicament uh, that we have to understand about the international order. This generated a second question. How, how are we to understand what the problem of empire is? How is empire conceived? What is it that makes it a problem of not only theoretical uh, reflection, uh, but political uh, mobilization, political imagination. So here I, I challenge a very standard view of what the problem of empire was. And that standard view takes empire to be a bilateral relationship of alien rule. Um, you know, the classic example of Britain ruling Ghana or Britain ruling Jamaica is one that thinks that the primary problem is foreign domination and that this structure of foreign domination between two political entities is characterized by the exclusion of the colony from international institutions, right? So vis-a-vis -vis the picture of the international order, the colony is a non-entity. It exists outside a system of equal and independent states, um, but is dominated by that system by that by members of that uh, system of equal um, uh, and independent states. Um, so the intervention of the book on this front is to reconstruct a theory of empire that takes not alien rule as the central predicament, but views unequal integration into a world system and racial hierarchy as the dominant structures of empire. This was a view that could then help to make sense of places like Haiti, Liberia, and Ethiopia, all of which would be independent states throughout the 19th and into the 20th century, um, but would be subject to onerous, um, onerous uh, uh, burdens and obligations and limited rights uh, within the structure of the state system. Uh, it would also be one that takes seriously the material foundations of the world order the ways in which a, a set of relations inaugurated by the transatlantic slave trade shaped and structured made, made the modern world in a literal sense, right? So it would be this set of concerns and preoccupations that um, Black internationalists would articulate and advance uh, throughout uh, the, the early 20th century, but in particular, the, 19, the interwar period. Um, uh, so, so I want, I want, I think, I want to focus in particular on the racial hierarchy uh, point, um, um, because this isn't just a story about, about, you know, what we might call black states like Haiti and Liberia and their relationship uh, to a, a global color line. But as I've, I've, I've already indicated, it's a story of a kind of long continuity. Um, of Africa's relationship to the to the modern world that begins with the slave trade as it's as a, as a central kind of inaugural moment. Um, um, and this helps to explain for figures like Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois and George Padmore, the ways that the, what's called the new imperialism, the moment of the scramble for Africa in, in the late 19th century is an extension of of a kind of earlier iteration of, 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 that, of that experience of the slave trade. So in various ways, the argument that theorists would advance is, is that empire was a form of enslavement. It was the extension of a set of kind of um, uh, structures by which 
black labor would be secured uh, and mobilized in service of metropolitan ends. So there's both a story then of a historical continuity and a structural continuity about the place and position of Africa in the world. Um, so this understanding of empire as a structure of unequal integration and racial hierarchy uh, shapes what I call anti-colonial world making in the book. Um, and, and I argue that uh, there are three features of this uh, world making, which is designed to overcome hierarchy and generate an equal set of legal, political, and economic relations. And those, those three features are one, um, the inauguration of a right to self-determination, which is the kind of legal component of this vision. Uh, the generation or production of regional federations, uh, which is the political vision um, behind uh, behind anti-colonial world making. And the third is the new international economic order, which imagines the structures of global redistribution that could undo some of the economic hierarchy between global south and global north. Um, so I think there are three important takeaways uh, from that this this picture of of uh, world making. One is that when framed uh, against uh, the view of international racial hierarchy, even the right to self-determination, which is most often thought to be simply an extension and elaboration of Wilsonian internationalism, appears to be a radical project. Um, and it's radical because what the right to self-determination makes possible is not only formal or legal equality, but it basically become, becomes the grounds for demanding equal decision-making within, interna within international organizations, most importantly, um, the United Nations. And it then ends up being the grounds or the basis for economic redistribution. So in fact, this kind of basic legal point ends up becoming a kind of proliferating into a much more substantive claim about equality. Um, I think the other basic point is, is an argument that sovereign equality, the claim that the states ought to be equal uh, in the international order, is not a kind of European invention that then gets kind of universalized at the moment of decolonization, but it's actually a subaltern or, or post-colonial invention. Um, it, it's, it's the peripheral states and the decolonizing states that give form and shape to a claim of sovereign equality rather than simply picking up on an idea um, already developed and articulated in Europe. Um, the other, the second point is that I think, you know, as I try to make the case in the book, um, we ought to understand the project of nation building and world making as entangled projects. So one, you know, one uh, ambition I have in the book is to try to show the ways in which nationalism, rather than being the kind of opposite or antagonist to internationalism, were in these in these moments kind of mutually imbricated and that a set of nationalists you know had to imagine the international conditions of realizing their project of, of self-determination or national independence and that this produced a way of thinking about how the transformation of the international order and the kind of social transformation of the national order were combined and viewed as um necessary parts, two parts of the same coin of achieving self-determination. I think this has a important reverberations for thinking about assessing the post-colonial state in the present. So, you know, there, there would be after the moment of decolonization, especially in the 1990s, a variety of um, um, arguments about the failure of the post-colonial state, the crisis of the post-colonial state. And a lot of these would have a variety of kind of internal or domestic accounts of what that crisis were, right? Um, a variety of sociological deficits, the lack of a middle class, low levels of literacy, underdevelopment, all of these take the post-colonial state and really all states as if they're containers and as if there's nothing from the outside that shapes and affects um, what's going on on the inside, right? So 
I think this analysis of the relationship of nation building and world making, more than simply revealing how nationalists could also be internationalists, is an opportunity to revise our kind of analytic perspective of how we understand the state um, and how we understand the relationship between the domestic and the international. I think this is really important in the post-colonial context, but I think it's also true um, you know, in, um, among other states. Um, so the third thing I want to highlight and goes back to where I started this talk about the contemporary crisis crises we face is, you know, I think for a variety for at least since the election of Donald Trump, we might say there's been a lot of hand wringing about the crisis, the failure of the liberal international order. It's kind of undoing in this contemporary moment. And I think one thing that this project allows us to see is trace an earlier origins moment to this crisis of the liberal international order. First, I, I want to say, I think the question of the liberal international order, we might we must always ask for whom was it a liberal international order because it wasn't for a lot of people. But that point aside, I think what this project allows us to do is look at the ways in which actually um, American deflection from international law and international institutions did not start with uh, with the war on terror and certainly not with Donald Trump, but it started already in the 1970s as a set of responses to this post colonial revolution within international institutions. So it was in rejection to the new international economic order, for instance, that American uh, policymakers, State Department folks begin to think about a way of projecting American power outside of the regulations and structures of, of, of international institutions. Um, so I'm happy to say more about that. You know, I think um, I, I have some thoughts about some of the limitations of the project, which maybe I'll say very quickly, given now I've written this book a long time ago. So I've thought a lot about what the limits of the project are. Um, and so I'll just say a few, some, some three things that I continue to wrestle with, and then, um, and then I look forward to your questions and comments, and I'll be quick on this part. Um, so yeah, I just want to point out three things in the book, I think, that remain um, uh, in various ways unresolved. Um, you know, I think one is about the status of race in the project as an analytic that both the characters of the the characters at the center of the book mobilize and that I deploy. Um, so for those who've read it, um, you will notice, I think, that uh, the kind of an analysis and critique of racial hierarchy is really important to the first moments of the book, uh, the discussion of the League of Nations and the United Nations. But as we get you know, further away from the moment of formal decolonization, uh, when I'm discussing the regional um, federations, for instance, or the new international economic order, an analytic of racial hierarchy is less clearly the language that the actors, my actor, the actors I'm studying use. And I think it would be worth thinking through what 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 makes why that changes right and how that changes and really thematizing that point i say that because i think it's important you know at the level of the international but in general i think to historicize race and racialization the work it's doing um and and so i think attending more closely to when it's an important you know vector and when it's not or when it's more subdued or how it gets transformed would be something I would I would have done slightly um, differently. Um, um, so you know I think the other a second point I wish I had thought more about in the book is the ways that I think as I've as I've tried to suggest here briefly I think this moment of decolonization was really innovative in the ways that it thought about the requirements of an international order. But I think there's some ways in which this, this post-colonial thinking about world order maintains a set of commitments um, that you know, we would be familiar with from kind of more classical thinking about inter international re relations. And one of those is the ways in which a kind of Anal the ways that the state gets analogized to individuals is still very important um, to the post-colonial thinking at the center of this book. So one very concrete instance of this in the book is 
in the moment of the new international economic order, post-colonial states, and I show this through Michael Manley and Julius Nerere, are making the argument that the states of the global south constitute a working class, right? That they are the working class of, of the global order. And I think there you see this ways in which the kind of the state as a as a kind of class actor, as a as a kind of category we think about at the level of individuals within a society, gets it does a lot of powerful work about thinking about the ways that the world is an uneven but integrated economic unit. But of course, it also effaces the the ways in which states internally are built by class relations, right? So that would be one place. I, you know, I think there would be more work um, to do. You know, and then I think ultimately, like this is this is a book about um, state builders, and it's about state builders who had a particular view of what the problem of empire was, and it was one again. Uh, you know, another way we might characterize the way they thought about the problem of empire was as a set of relations of dependence, right? Um, again, a dependency theory will be familiar to some of you, but so a set of dependencies um, between states, right? And dependence as a kind of um, sign of something to be overcome, right? And and to be um, to be transcended. Um, and I think this this focus and preoccupation with dependence as a kind of thing that one has to overcome generates um, like a vision of, of, of a, a sort of paternalistic vision of the state in particular, the state as the agent that transforms people's dependence on, you know, backward cultures within the country, right? As the state that transforms its dependence on in the global stage. And I think there are like other ways, you know, uh, uh, different ways of posing the problem of empire, say, ones that think of the, you know, uh, uh, empire as a structure primarily of coercion, right, or some would, would have, would generate a, a much more, a deeper critique of the state and would, would lead to much, you know, um, anti-statist visions of what decolonization might look like. And I think this is a really important thing about just trying to proliferate. Like we we can't take for granted what empire was. And by trying to think about and what empire is uh, in even in the present, by being clearer about what people are what people are criticizing about this, we also see that the project of decolonization was actually manifold, multiple, and the version we got um, we got is just one version of it, right? And that there are many others to be mined and to be thought about. So, I will stop there and just look forward um, to your questions and want to say again how grateful I am and um, you know for the award and for. Uh, for joining you all here. Okay, perfect. Um, and then just really quick, if anyone did have any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, I know Professor Magni and I, or at least Professor Magni, he can see them, so I'll be able to relay that. Um, so moving into some questions that we have for you today, um, you talked a lot about sort of post-colonial effects and the impacts of um, post-colonial effects on the world today. So a question that I would like to ask are, um, is what are some post-colonial effects you believe are still strongly prevalent in the world today? And if you would like to just elaborate on that. Yeah, um, I mean, if I think the whole world is a post-colony, so, so um, you know, I'll just, I'll just give one example, um, mostly because I just came from a discussion about a paper on migration, but, you, you know, for instance, I think like um, the debate about migration that we've seen and that we're about to see again, given the crisis in Ukraine, is always a, you know, that, that, that question, one, it's always framed as about um, global south migrants coming to the global north, say the Mediterranean as the site, and the Mediterranean North Africa now as a site of constant um um, you know, um, uh, policing, you know, in, intense forms of policing, bordering, surveillance, and violence as a result. 
And I think one, you know, the, the that way of thinking about or like the justifications for those forms of policing and bordering are always ones that think of the state and Europe as a internally constituted project as if it had no historical and political relations with the people who are trying to migrate there, right? So I think surfacing the histories of empire and the not just like the historical, the the like the ones that existed up to the moment of decolonization, but the present ones, right? For for instance, the fact that the currency that is used by you know across French West Africa is pegged to the euro, right? Before it was to the franc so there's not just that there's like there were a historical set of relations but there are mechanisms monetary financial trade political that continue to reproduce the set of relationships right again let's think with the example of france and french west africa and so if that's the case right if it is the case that europe has a set of political economic and social relations with uh, you know, African states, and not only do they have these relations, but these relations produce inequality at these two, you know, at these two sites, right? And it produces wealth in Europe and uh, immiseration in, in, in West Africa. Then we might think about immigration. Um, you know, le it's not about, you know, uh, just random people who showed up at your borders, right? But people who you have a set of historical and ongoing relations with right and that should change the kind of normative and political calculations about what it what immigration means um and this point is made really well by a, an article by legal scholar tendaya chuemi who's at ucla law school in an article called um uh, migration as decolonization thank you um, yeah, and so in sort of reading and researching about your book, um, something that I came across I thought was interesting um, is why did countries such as Ethiopia and Liberia sought self-determination rights with the UN? And what do you think this says about the power that institutions can signal? Yeah, so both Liberia and Ethiopia um, seek membership in the League of Nations in, um, in part because, I mean, um, you know, in order sovereignty or or it's being a state doesn't it doesn't matter unless other people think you're a state unless other states recognize you as a state. So it's a all constantly relational set of experiences or 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 attributes, right? Um, and so the reason that one what these states sought, you know, a membership in these bodies was because they were their sovereignty was meaningless in the absence of, of, of it being institutionally recognized in that form. Um, I mean, one could say that, that obviously, I, as I try to show in that chapter, that recognition didn't work very well for them, right, especially in the case of Ethiopia. But I think it's, it's an illustration of the ways in which, um, I mean, there's, it's not like their situation would have been better off had they not sought inclusion, right? Um, had they not sought membership in these bodies. So I think it's this both a sense of there aren't many options in this. You can't, there's no full exit from, from the state system if you're a state, right? Um, but also, you know, that membership does make possible certain kinds of things like uh, you have a, you have a political platform um, on the international stage that makes it possible to galvanize support in a variety of ways. This certainly was the case um, with the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in, the, in 1935. And this would be especially important in the, in the UN moment after World War II. So, you know, I think when the UN is created in 1945, no, no anti-colonialist thinks this is going to be, thinks that the UN um, charter as it's written is going to help support liberation, um, you know, national independence. But yet they understand that this is a kind of really important in international forum and that to be able to capture it in service of the project of decolonization would be a really important project. So they don't give up on the institution. They, they, 
they do capture it and, and transform it from within. Um, you know, and I, I will say about that, I think like institutional, I think institutions are flexible, they can be transformed, but there are also limits to them, right? They can't be like made completely radical from what they are, right? So there are things about the UN that were inflexible and things about it that were flexible. And um, I think they, you know, I think that's why they they sought to capture it. And I, I think the importance is, you know, um, there's a quote in the paper, um, or sorry, in the in the paper in the book about um, Emil Carr Cabral, who was in the middle of a you know nationalist liberation movement, and he says when the UN, when, when the 1960 declaration on in, the granting of independence happens, he says, look, like we are now like, we are soldiers of the United Nations. This is our international kind of like declaration that, you know, we are in the right. And so it can be also that it, it generated um, resources, discursive resources, uh, a fora, right, um, and in some institutional power to be able to tr to shift a power, a the power structure in unprecedented ways. So after 1960, for instance, the United Nations can investigate um, co colonial regimes, a power that it did not have before 1960. So there is this sense of also the possibility of transformation within institutions. Thank you. Um, yeah, and moving more towards a um, personal tangent, um, I, we were just wondering sort of what were sort of the key drivers and motivations for you to write this book? Yeah, I think, I mean, I said a little bit about the specific moment that drove the book at the beginning, like a real sense that, you know, uh, a set of transformations had happened in international politics and um, and theorizing about international politics in the post Cold War period that never really took seriously um, the um, you know uh, the the rich debates and the rich possibilities of the moment of decolonization, right? That kind of sideline that as just another moment of the expansion of the Westphalian order, that there nothing new happened in that moment. There was nothing to learn about, about the world politics, um, uh, you know, in that moment. So for me, I think that was a really one important driver. The other thing I didn't say that in the kind of framing, I think that's important is, and I mentioned I you know, was in a joint PhD program in African-American studies and political science. And you know, in, in, in African-American studies um, inaugurated by Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic in the early nineties, but, but by really other important books such as Michelle Stevens' Black Empire, there had been a lot of thinking through of black internationalism and of kind of or or pan Africanism, um, and for me, a lot of you know in that work there was a deep sense that 1945 meant the kind of closure or the end of a really rich and fertile moment of black internationalism, uh, and then the kind of rise of the nation state. So Michelle Stevens's book, for instance, ends with the the West Indies Federation, and I wanted to you know I think it's I think what happens after the post-war period can't be easily just simply assimilated into the interwar period. But I wanted to tell the story of forms of internationalism that coexisted with the formation of the state in the, in the post-45 period. So in some ways, an attempt to think about what the institutional life and legacy of Black internationalism was in the moment of decolonization. All right, perfect. And then did anyone in the audience maybe have any questions? They can feel free to raise your hand, speak aloud. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Professor Diltz. I mean, I'll just, I'll jump in. Hey, it's good to see you. Sorry, I was a few Hi, minutes late. <laughs> no uh, I just, I was, I had two thoughts. I just dropped one in the chat when I was thinking there. Um, part of it is also just to, maybe celebrate a little bit of the other breaking news from your Chicago, for people who don't know, which is that um, 
you were instrumentally responsible in building an incredible new department at UChicago, which just announced this week of race, diaspora, and indigeneity. Um, and I, but I now I can't help think listening to the description of your work here and going back to your book this last week about some of those internal tensions I maybe that maybe come out from on the global stage, what it means to build, try and build decolonizing spaces inside what is literally a colonizing institution on the south side of Chicago. Um, so I mean, I was just sort of wanted first also to congratulate you on that that project um, and that seeing it come to fruition, but also I don't know to ask uh, if, if this parallel is just in my head or if this is something maybe that you can say something about or want to say something about. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, yeah, it's a very it's an exciting moment and the product of you know two years of work and you know I think one thing that will not be obvious from the institutional announcement about the project is that the vision for a department was never like a standalone vision it came out of a wider campaign called the more than diversity campaign that was thinking about the university not just as the space of knowledge production and you know and hiring and uh, faculty etc as teaching of students but but also as a kind of, as you put it, like um, a major economic and political force on, on the South side, which has transformed the landscape of, 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 and of, South, of the South side, which polices the South side, you know, for miles across the university. So, you know, I say that to say that in addition to the, the victory around the department, uh, we also were able as part of this com faculty committee to initiate a um, council on university community relations, which is charged with looking at the history of the university's relationships to the South side and documenting the ways it played a role in urban renewal in the transformation of, 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 the, of the South side and to make a series of recommendations um, um, and that this council is independent of the university. It's um, it includes community members. It includes faculty. Um, so it's so I say that to say for me that um, the department is it it is it's not it's not sufficient on its own terms, but as part of a kind of wider landscape of attempts to try and reimagine and reconstitute the university. But I think you know just to um, I think what the, the parallels you see are not incorrect, right? In the sense that this too is an attempt to try and carve out space within an institutional form that for 50 years has been inimical to this precise thing. So, so you know, and that raises a variety of challenges. I think like in terms, it's, it's uh, like anyone that's been in a black studies department will know what, how it is that the forces of the universe, like when you're in a, depart a department at the university, you are part of the institution in some real way. And it, like how you continue to like car make that space not entirely the kind of organized around the logic of the university, I think is a, a hard challenge. I'm excited to be doing this project with people who are really attentive to that and who you know, are really committed to the creation of a different kind of space, but it's TBD whether we'll be able to do that. All right, thank you. And then any other questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, go ahead, um, John Parrish. Thanks. Um, Thanks for a really stimulating talk and, and congratulations on uh, this award. Uh, I'm going to ask a really broad question, but you circled a lot in the um, talk around the uh, immediate post-World War II era of decolonization. And then you also began the talk with some thoughts about the moment we're in. And I just want to invite you to, can you compare those moments or think about, I'm really interested in the present moment. What is the present moment like? What's it propitious for? What's different about the moment we're in right now as you think about continuing the project of decolonizing? Can you just give me some thoughts about the moment we're in? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I mean, 
you know, in some ways, um, like the fact of, so the fact of bipolarity in the immediate post-war period was in some ways very generative for this project of decolonization, right? It, this The fact that there wasn't one center made it possible for peripheral states to position themselves in different kinds of ways. And when that bipolarity ended, I think, in at the end of the Cold War, it made it made it less possible, I think, for for a variety. I mean, there's many reasons that explain the kind of crisis of the third world, the kind of fa failure or end of the third world project. But I think that is one one kind of condition about the about the you know the by the 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 specific structural logic of the of the cold uh, the post war period that was you, you know good. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we may be entering another world moment of multipolarity, right? So I think it will be interesting what that means for peripheral states or the so the previously known as the third world states. What might that make possible for, um, you know, for these kinds of projects? Um, but you know, I my sense about there, it's really interesting to have also written this book, like you know, as as a kind of public debate about um, decolonization was back on the table, right? There is all this attention to the language of decolonization. You know, me, we know it probably as faculty primarily in the form of attempt, you know, student demands around decolonizing the curriculum and the university, but it's not just in that space, right? It's in the, it's in the kind of arguments in South Africa about the like incompleteness of the post-apartheid transition. It's in it's in the end SARS movement in Nigeria about the kind of persistence of state violence, right? So, you know, my, I, I don't know what the international project, like I, I find it hard to imagine a return to the form of third worldist organiz, organizing organization that is state led coming back in, in this moment. Um, and, you know, I can say more about that, but I do think that there, there are these kind of movement to movement formations that are really interesting, right? That are developing a similar kind of language, I think, in which a critique of the state, and, and this is the key difference for me, like the state was for a variety of actors in that immediate post-war period imagined as the agent of transformation as the as the kind of vector through which one would get you know social justice democracy all of those things and i think there's widespread skepticism across the third world about that being the institutional vector through which the promise of decolonization will be realized right um and so i think there's a variety of really exciting writing about what comes out of that space where you've given up on the state, but but there's not clear what takes the form, what, what in other institutional imaginaries might come out of. So I'll just name one book that I think is really a great one to think with, um, which is Yarimar Bonilla's book, Non-Sovereign Futures, which thinks about Guadeloupe. And, and Guadeloupe is a great place to think about this because it never went through the formal decolonization process, right? So, so you know, I'm, you know, I, I guess when I think about like where will world making energy come from in this moment, I think about similar kinds of South-South collaboration, but that are much more movement to movement rather than state to state. Um, so indigenous rights movements, environmental justice movements, anti, -abol you know, abolition, anti kind of state violence kinds of projects. So to me, that's where the political energy is how that like scales up, you know, into um, to structure international politics or international relations, I'm not sure, you know, um, but that's, that's what I would say. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, and then Sarah. Hi, I'm sorry to be off video. I'm multitasking with childcare, but um, I'm just asking this question as an admirer, not as a political scientist, but um, I'm really struck by the expanse of your work. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about method and form 
and how a kind of Black Studies interdisciplinary method shapes your work. I'm struck by the historiographic character of your kind of political theory. I'm struck by like um, how um, much you're thinking about Black internationalism as a theory of time. And I'm just wondering how you think about your work methodologically going forward, whether that's kind of in terms of interdisciplinarity or whether it's in terms of kind of what Professor Dilt gestured at, which is a, a kind of seamlessness with which you model um, organizing and scholarly work. Um, but I guess this is just a question about gesturing to the future and how you're approaching your work um, going forward in terms of method and topics and um, yeah, what you're thinking about in terms of your next project. I really appreciate that and nice to hear your voice, Sarah. Um, I think this it's a really, it's a great question. And, you know, I'll say that there are so many parts of my project um, that are like really influenced and shaped by Black studies. Like I'll just name one, one moment of this um, to illustrate, illustrate what I'm saying. So in the first couple of chap in the first chapter about Ethiopia and Liberia, I, I make this case that Ethiopia and, and Liberia are kind of burdened members of, of the inter of the League of Nations where they have more onerous obligations and limited rights. And for me, that way of thinking about, about like the moment of freedom, right? At, you know, at, at the level of the state was really shaped by Saidiya Hartman's scenes of subjection, right? And the way she talks about burdened individuality after, the, after emancipation. And I think like in some ways that's just a very one instance of the ways in which the kind of uh, I omnivorous reading, the kind of capacious reading practice that is required to be um, to be a black studies scholar is like makes you see, you look at the same thing and you see it entirely differently, right? Like it's very like I loved the language of burdenedness because for those who are political theorists and who have had the displeasure of reading Rawls's John Rawls's the Law of Peoples, you'll know he also uses the language of burdened, right? But burden for him is just like you're poor, basically. You're a poor country. It has no set of like you know whatever a way of relating. A, a set of a way of thinking about the interrelationships that generate burdens and obligations. Um, so I think there's like um, omnivorous quality to black studies that I, I, you know, I think it's hard, right? It, it, if it's requires, you know, I think people talk about interdisciplinarity as if it's like, it requires so much discipline to be interdisciplinary in some ways. And maybe another way, like I think perhaps that might feel like, um, you know, I think another way people of course talk about it is that it's, it's like an undisciplined way of reading, but it requires, it's like a practice, a habit that one has to develop and in nurture and cultivate. It doesn't just come, come out of the, you know, so I just like the, the labor of doing that and the labor that people before me have done that. And then I hope to continue I think I see it as kind of intergenerational and um, yeah, like a real set of commitments to be, to cultivate that form, that reading practice. Um, and it's in some ways, so my new work is, is actually moving back to the twenties and thirties moment to that like high point of, of internet, black internationalism. And it's an, it's thinking through Garveyism and partly, um, Partly, I decided to focus on Garveyism because, um, in a lot of ways, you know, the book I wrote is one that's incredibly focused on the high politics of decolonization, and it's it takes it reads like very elite statesmen, and it's interested in this this scene of politics that happens in the League of Nations, in the United Nations, in you know interstate debates, etc., and. I did want to think about a space of popular Pan-Africanism and um, to think about kind of what it means to theorize movement, uh, mass movement. Um, 
And for me, what that is also pushing me to do is to think about, I think of myself as a kind of person who's doing the history of ideas and political ideas. And um, it's, it, it's pushing me to think about like idea, what, what political ideas are differently, right? So how we might theorize uh, performance and practice, um, like what do we do with the kind of spectacle of the UNIA convention and what kind of political ideas are being generated in that form rather than kind of in the written text of Du Bois's The World in Africa, right? Or, or even within Du Bois's own oeuvre, how we might think about his kind of pageant, the star of Ethiopia in relation to something like um, The World in Africa. So I think in some ways it's like I really, again, this is a project that's really pushing me to move beyond the containers of political theory. Um, yeah. And I should also just say that like in terms of the practice and like kind of organizing and being a, you know, a academic in some ways, Sarah Haley was my organizer as a graduate student, and we're part of this organization called Scholars for Social Justice. So um, for me, it's like, I think of both intellectual work and, um, you know, organizing work, the kind of work that led to the formation of this department as collaborative exercises. I think there's a lot of ways that the uh, scholarly work is often read, understood as a kind of solitary thing. We go do our writing. But I really think of myself, even as I'm writing, as in creating a community and extending a community that I've been lucky to be a part of. And in some ways, in that sense of building community, participating in community, I think of the organizing work and the intellectual work as doing parallel kinds of, our parallels in that way. Thank you. Um, and we are nearing the end of our time. so. Um, just really quick, are there any last questions from anyone in the audience? All right, perfect. So I don't see any. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude today's um, book award. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Adam Gedichu, for your time. Um, I speak on behalf of the entire LMU community when I say that this was incredibly insightful and a very important conversation to have. Um, if anyone is interested in specifics about the book or past GPI Book Awards, I highly recommend checking out the GPI Book Award webpage. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day, and thank you once again for joining us today. Well, thank you all again very much. Um, it was a pleasure to join you virtually, and I look forward to coming to visit you all in LMU. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.